we had last time I checked, we'd had a good 60 um, registrations. So we'll see. They won't all come through, but we'll we'll That's see. I, that is it's really good. Okay, so in just a minute, we'll go live. There we are. I'll just press start. Hi everyone, welcome. We'll just give it another few minutes while uh, people are moving in uh, from the waiting room before we get started. Okay, great. That's a few people still uh, joining us, which is great. Um, but I will just get started um, and try and stick to the promised schedule. So I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, first introductory webinar to a new series that we're going to be running uh, through the first half of this year. So welcome and happy new year. Um, and this series is on occupant centric simulation aided building design um, and follows the book of the same name, um, which Liam and Farhang will be telling you about uh, in due course. And the webinar is presented by the Abitsa Education Committee. Um, and it's part of our mission to offer training sessions, which are open. This is available for non-members as well as members. Um, and we initiate, develop and encourage uh, new education materials and methods. And we also try to identify training and education needs throughout the simulation community, um, whether you're uh, researchers, practitioners, uh, or whether you work in the public sector. So do please check out the IBIPSA website if you'd like to know more about that. Now I said this is an introductory webinar. This is the first in a series which is going to be running through until the end of June. So the details of all of these and the sign up links have been shared on LinkedIn. Um, the recording of this video will be on YouTube and you'll have the links there as well. And this will go out to the IBIPSA mailing list as well. Uh, so you'll be able to sign up for all of these webinars. So each of these webinars is presented by a real expert in the field, uh, usually the lead author for the book chapter that they'll be talking about. Um, and they're going to give you a real insight into the whys and wherefores and then the how to's of occupant centric simulation aided building design. And we're really delighted to have such an illustrious group of speakers uh, able to join us uh, over the first half of this year. And what we'd like to do today is to ask Liam and Farhang to give us a brief introduction and really just to whet our appetites for this seminar series. So I'm going to hand over to Liam now, who's going to share his screen. And we are going to hear a bit about what's in store. Thanks so much, Pamela. Um, bear with me as I share my screen. There we go. Pamela, can you confirm that you can see? Thanks. Um, perfect. Well, welcome everyone. And it's a real pleasure for us to be presenting 
our book uh, or an introduction to our book. Um, and I'm joined here by Farhang Tamasevi, who's a, a co-author for the book. Um, and so, of course, the book is called Occupant-Centric Simulation Building Design. And our goal today is uh, to provide a high-level overview of the book, as well as explaining why we were motivated to spend a couple of years writing this book. Um, so here's the book, the cover of the book. Um, and uh, Farhang took this photo and we, we thought it was great because it showed a lot of the things that uh, are relevant here, like people and buildings. Um, and the book is free, open source, um, open access rather. And so you're welcome to uh, download it. We're really here just to spread the word about it. We're not going to make any money from this book. Um, so what was the motivation for writing this book? Um, I should say there's a group of about 30 different people who contributed to the book. We're just the uh, co-editors, but over the next six months, you'll hear from um, lead authors of each chapter. Um, but the authors are very diverse. And I would say I learned a lot just by writing the book because um, the authors are architects, engineers, human factors experts, AI experts, uh, urban planners, and so on. Um, the reason we wanted to write this book is because we feel that current design approaches for buildings, of course, are remarkably void of occupants. Um, and occupants are often discussed in very passive ways, um, referring to heat gains or um, bioeffluence, odors, CO2, etc. cetera. Um, but we kind of forget why we're actually designing buildings. Um, and I say this especially from a simulation world where it's all too tempting to reduce occupants to something that produce heat um, and consume um, without really thinking about their needs and wants and behaviors. And the fact that um, building design can affect behavior, that's something that um, most building codes and standards and sort of design guides specifically neglect the fact that that building design affects behavior. And so that's something we want to reinforce with this book. Um, there's often complaints about the, the performance gap and then occupants are blamed because they're the easiest scapegoat. You know, it's not bad design, it's not bad operations, it's those darn occupants. Um, and in fairness, we don't know who's going to occupy a building often when we're designing it. Um, but I don't think this can be used as a complete excuse for um, neglecting occupants or, or um, neglecting design uh, performance targets. Um, and the common solution to this problem is take away opportunities from people. If people are the source of uncertainty, um, then why would we not just take away those operable windows or those electronics or those um, knobs and dials that allow people to um, affect building performance? Of course, we don't agree that this should happen, but um, this is all too common. We lock our windows because people will, will screw up. Um, and this photo shows a, a nice example, I think, of part of the problem, which is, um, so just for a little context, this is the inside of an apartment building in Ottawa. And um, for one reason or another, we have a fully glazed facade beside the bathroom. Uh, or the washroom or restroom, whatever you want to call it. Um, but to me, this indicates that it was not the occupants that were a consideration for um, design, but rather the outside of the building and the aesthetic was the consideration. Um, and this sort of sums up part of the problem is that we, we put design and aesthetic before the occupants. Um, this figure is from the ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guide. And I, I think it's fantastic for um, explaining to designers how heat flow is, is very kind of interactive. All these different systems interact. Um, and so, I mean, it, it shouldn't be a novel concept, but the idea that envelope affects HVAC and vice versa, like even this is a bit of a stretch, I think, for, for some practitioners. Um, maybe they understand conceptually, but then when it comes to practice, we forget that we need to do integrated design. Um, but I show this slide because occupancy is in the bottom right. Um, and sure enough, occupants are just a, a source of sensible and latent heat. So not to say 
um, that ASHRAE considers occupants just a source of sensible and lean heat, but it, it just reinforces the idea that it's a one-way path and that people produce stuff um, and they're kind of noise just like weather is. Um, and we feel that that's really not the case. And um, there's often a distrust of occupants. I like this photo, um, which is admittedly posed, but it's copied from another photo I saw of a, a real situation where um, we have a thermostat, which theoretically could be operable by the occupants, but then operators covered it up because there's a, a distrust that the occupants will do something so-called bad. Um, and then the occupants had the final word because they put these freezes on top to fool the thermostat into thinking that conditions are cold, which would presumably um, cause more heating to happen. So what we prefer is a reframing that recognizes that occupants are part of the building and that there's a two-way interaction between occupants and buildings. Um, so whereas conventional thinking is that occupants are just a source of noise, and result in a certain performance level of the building. We like to recognize the building design, things like the resulting indoor environmental quality affects occupants and occupants are going to um, respond accordingly. If things are really uncomfortable, occupants are going to do wild, unexpected, probably inefficient things. And so there's good reason to provide comfort other than providing comfort because that's a good thing to do. It also, um, prevents these wild behaviors that, that lead to performance gap. I think this is obvious, but um, we often don't consider it in practice. So this book was born out of a international project called IEA EBC NX79. I co-led this with Andreas Wagner um, of KIT in Germany. Um, and we're, we're nearing the end of the project. Officially, we're at the end, we're just reporting, uh, but I wanted to provide some context and there will actually be a, a follow-up project for this that's under development. The book itself has 12 chapters, um, and I will just very briefly touch on the uh, at least the core chapters in the next couple of minutes. Um, so it starts out with fundamentals. What do occupants need um, in terms of indoor environmental quality? Uh, what are the activities that, are, that occupants are doing in buildings? Um, how do we bring occupants into the design process? This is a non-trivial topic and chapter. Um, and then we look at how do we get information from occupants to somewhat customize our designs to make sure that we're satisfying the actual occupants of a building. We look at reframing um, building performance in terms of an occupant-centric approach. And then the right side, the last five main chapters, um, get into modeling and simulation, which is probably the interest of this group. Um, so we go everywhere from um, modeling basics, occupant modeling basics, to how do you use these models in practice? How do you choose the most appropriate models? Um, and how might you use occupant models to understand how building interfaces like thermostats and light switches affect performance? And how could you, um, model and simulate occupant-centric controls. And then we end with some case studies. So you'll hear a lot more about these in the coming months. This is just a very light uh, flavor of, of what the book is about. Yeah, so the second chapter goes over sort of a framework of all the different occupant needs. We do focus mainly on indoor environmental quality here, but of course we recognize there's other things like safety, security, um, protection from fire, and so on. And then we look at how these different needs of occupants map onto particular uh, building design features. And this is, to some extent, a philosophical chapter in that we recognize that um, the field of IEQ is very much evolving and, and we don't have all the answers. We still can't predict whether someone will be comfortable in a space. The next chapter is about uh, bringing occupants into the um, decision-making process. Um, again, this is a, a really interesting chapter uh, led by uh, Clarice, and she's looking at how do we uh, kind of maintain information, well, gather information, maintain information, and ensure that all the different 
designers are properly incorporating this information into um, the design process. And there's a lot of discussion on BIM here. The next chapter is about um, kind of novel ways to get information from occupants to better design our buildings. Um, and it, it does this through the whole life cycle. And so perhaps ironically or unfortunately, there's way too much emphasis right now on post-occupancy evaluations, understanding whether people are satisfied in their buildings. Um, but of course, there's only so much you can do once a building is occupied. So we look all the way back to conceptual design and involving um, occupants, even if they're not the actual occupants, just getting the occupant perspective into the design process. And so um, this chapter looks at a wide range of opportunities, interviews, focus groups, design threats, questionnaires, diaries, um, some social media based approaches, sensor based approaches, etc. Um, the next chapter looks at occupant centric metrics, and these are a way of reframing performance, not by normalizing by things like floor area, which we think is um, a little bit problematic often in that, for example, if you want to compare two homes and their energy performance, if one home has a lot more occupants in it than the other, arguably, um, this will be a higher performance building. And yet we don't really recognize that that the purpose of buildings is to serve people. That's the main purpose, at least. Um, and then we move on to modeling occupants. Um, and while one of the goals is to improve predictions of things like energy or carbon emissions, um, we also have other objectives, like understanding how likely someone is to interact with the building um, as a function of different building design. So current methods um, are very much one way we, we impose these schedules as a way to describe occupants. And this necessarily does not recognize that building design affects occupants because these schedules are fixed. Um, whereas we're trying to move to this model that recognizes building design affects occupants, occupants affect buildings, and we'd like to make sure that that dynamic relationship is properly represented. Um, and so we look at some of the features of, of so-called desirable occupant model traits, things like stochasticity, which has been the obsession of many researchers over the last decade. Um, I think Farhang and I at least are not sold on, on the necessity of having stochastic models. Um, arguably a really good schedule with accurate assumptions um, will often be just as good as a, a very complex model. But these are the sorts of things we discuss. Um, and on that note, the next chapter is about fit for purpose occupant modeling. And this looks at trying to find the sweet spot between very simple models and very complex models. And the argument is um, simple models are are easy to implement. And that's maybe one of the reasons why we've focused on simple models in industry. And certainly building codes are, are quite simple, maybe simplistic, um, but that would come at the cost of accuracy. On the other hand, if we make our models extremely complex, no one understands them. They're very hard to enforce from a, a building code and, and a permit perspective. Um, there's lots of room for error because uh, there's just so many parameters to define that it's, it's easy to make mistakes and so on. So this chapter is about finding that, that sweet spot that balances accuracy and complexity. And really that could be said for any modeling domain, just not, not just occupants. Um, the next chapter looks at different techniques to incorporate occupants into the design process. So now that we have our models and we've chosen um, appropriate or, or fit for purpose models, how do we take those and actually um, use them to form design decisions? And so we look at lots of different techniques and these are not unique to occupant modeling. It's just that um, we're ensuring that occupant models and, and more advanced occupant models are incorporated into our simulations. So we look at things like sensitivity, um, parametric design and optimization. 
Arguably, one of the most basic things we can do is perform a sensitivity analysis regarding the occupants. This is not often done because, um, I guess, building codes and standards have reinforced the idea that there is a certain level of occupancy, and we will not deviate from that. But arguably, we should be designing our buildings to um, perform well under a wide range of occupant scenarios. So relatively empty, relatively full, something in between, you know, energy conserving occupants, energy um, or wasteful occupants, and so on. Um, and this is particularly relevant in the, the area of, era of post-COVID where our buildings are half empty at best, or maybe half full. Um, we also look at some more advanced techniques. This book is aimed not just at designers and practitioners, but also fairly uh, sophisticated researchers. So we look at something called robust design, um, which says or asks, can we come up with building designs that reduce uncertainty from occupants? And so, for instance, if we provide appropriate shading devices, uh, perhaps we're less likely to have these um, very triggering glare events that cause people to do things like um, tape aluminum foil over their window and permanently close the blind and so on. Um, so we've looked at an optimization problem that tries to reduce both average predicted lighting energy use and also uncertainty. And this is just illustrative. The next chapter looks at building interfaces and something that we really don't model and simulate very often is, is building interfaces. But we argue in this chapter that building interface design is critical. Things like what are the default settings? What are the interface features like buttons and knobs and sliders? Where is the interface? How many people does that um, system affect? And so on. And we look at some ways that um, interface design could actually be modeled so that we can understand how uh, building interface design and, and selection affects building performance. And so whereas um, a lot of these things are very implicit, we just define um, thermostat schedules uh, as a schedule, uh, we tried to look at how this could be elevated. The last core chapter looks at occupant-centric controls. Um, and the authors present methods for us to uh, model these different control assumptions. Um, and this might be rather trivial for things like demand control, uh, yeah, demand control ventilation, where all we need to know is the number of occupants to affect ventilation. Um, but the chapter also looks at more sophisticated controls that learn from occupants. So they learn preferences from occupants or they anticipate occupant arrival based on previous days and so on. And finally, the book ends with some case studies. And we thought this was really important because one of the things we're trying to argue in this book is that what we're doing now in design practice is not ideal. Um, and it's hard to argue that without actually demonstrating that some of the techniques we propose are feasible and, and show them in practice. And so we had uh, a number of case studies, seven, I believe, and to some extent, they're distributed globally, um, but they're also distributed in terms of when the researchers got involved in the process. So it was really important to us when we chose these case studies, um, not just to have a situation where the researcher was reporting on what happened, but for the researcher to actually be involved in the process. Um, because that's the main way we're going to try these techniques. And so I'll just show a few of them, not all of them. Um, so this first one was done by my uh, PhD student, Tarek, as well as uh, his co-supervisor, Brack Unai. And um, we were involved from fairly early in the design process. And I won't say we necessarily influenced design, but at least we were able to talk to all the different uh, designers and consultants to understand what was happening and kind of follow the process carefully. And just one highlight of that work um, was that Tarek um, interviewed the different designers, the architect, the energy modeler, the mechanical engineer, I guess we can't call the energy modeler a designer. That's another issue. Um, but the assumptions about internal gains from occupants varied by a factor of two. 
among these different professionals. And I think this is very telling. And his conclusion is we need to do a better job of communicating these assumptions because everyone's do using different assumptions. And there's some good reasons for this. Like mechanical engineers are going to be very risk adverse because uh, bad assumptions are going to lead to undersizing potentially. But it's still very telling to see these different assumptions. The next case study is in Budapest. And this was really neat in terms of involving occupants into the design process. And the, so they had very lengthy design charrettes, not with just professionals, but the eventual occupants. And in this case, they were trying to come up with a co-living design where there were things like shared kitchens and shared uh, living spaces. So quite a novel design, and at least in the uh, Western world uh, kind of context. And, and so the designers wanted to understand how this different way of doing housing would be accepted. The third case study back in Canada and in Quebec City, just east of here. Um, and this building was already built and it had been occupied for a few years. But what was neat here is that we were measuring very detailed levels of occupant behavior. Um, and we often hear that occupants can affect energy use by some order of magnitude. Well, sure enough, this building showed that between two apartments, you could see differences as much as 100 or, or 10 uh, between water use and um, electricity use. So really striking. The last one I'll talk about was in Redwood City, uh, basically where Stanford is in the US. Um, and this building was also built but what was novel about the, the case study and the research is that um, the, the student at the time, Andrew Santa, um, was trying to figure out who should sit close to each other based on their plug loads. So he measured plug loads, so kind of their computer use over the course of a year to understand who was interacting with each other. For instance, if two people go for lunch regularly together, then their, their computer power might um, decrease around the same time every day. Um, and the idea was we could improve um, seating layout to enhance collaboration. And this was before COVID. So uh, I, I guess we'll, we would get very different results today. Um, so with that said, um, I would like to wrap up and, and we will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Liam. That was fascinating. Uh, I know I've got lots of questions, um, and I'm sure the audience have as well. So uh, for the questions, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a box labelled Q&A. If you could put your questions in there, if you just type them, then I will put them to, uh, to Farhang and to Liam. Um, and just while you're typing, um, I'll start with a few of my own. Um, so uh, the first question I have, Farhang, is what do you see as the biggest risks when occupants are not at the heart of the design process? If you don't get it right, what happens? What are the biggest consequences? Uh, yeah, thank you, Pamela. Um, yeah, many things already also Liam touched on, uh, but uh, just to name a few, the very uh, well discussed one is the sort of performance gap if they are not at the heart of design. So you don't know how they use the building. So our assumption as to how the building performs, how much energy it needs uh, will differ uh, significantly from what happens actually in reality. That's what we call performance gap. Uh, but uh, even I would argue more important than that, if, the, if we can argue that the ultimate goal of the design is to provide a comfortable, inspiring, uh, pleasant uh, space for people, uh, that might be fully undermined if you don't know for what kind of people we design, if you don't know what special needs specific groups of people may have, uh, what kind of expectation, inspirations they have, right? If they are not at the heart of design, if you don't know them, uh, we may go in very different directions as to what they expect. Uh, so, of course, it's a big challenge, of course, uh, in uh, uh, common base of modern uh, uh, building uh, industry. So we don't know the actual occupants of buildings, but 
actually this book is actually trying to get to the heart of this problem, how far we can uh, bring occupants at the heart of design, even if you don't know the actual occupants to avoid these kind of problems. Thank you, that's really interesting. And can I just ask, who are the occupants? Are we talking primarily about office buildings and people working in office buildings, or is this applicable across the whole range? You presented um, some case studies in uh, in social housing that are included in the book. So is this, are the methods that you're talking about applicable to all types of buildings? Yeah, if I may continue to answer this question as well. Yes, absolutely. I wouldn't see any in uh, inherent uh, the, um, differentiation between uh, our presence in built environment. It can be office, it can be uh, our homes and so on. Uh, there is just one thing that uh, one may argue that traditionally uh, office buildings uh, are studied rather more uh, extensively uh, and maybe even specifically um, uh, university buildings because the researchers are pushing these studies to start with mainly and so the first buildings that we have access on that we have control is uh, maybe office buildings but uh, i don't think it is still at that stage now we have a range of building studies uh, studied and uh, it has come to also homes i for one have uh, assigned my own flat to my phd student and he's going to measure it during summer how i open the windows how i can cope with overheating so i think uh, this also very much uh, is linked with very challenging problems that we have, such as overheating now in Europe and so on. So it's really uh, across the board. Thank you. Um, and I think you, you touch on an issue that's just been raised um, by one of the audience, which is about whether there are studies of occupant centric simulation in buildings without air conditioning systems. Uh, not many homes in uh, in the UK have air conditioning systems, uh, so I'm a pr presuming, Fahang, that you don't live in a in a super no, high end I wanted to, apartment. It, yeah, I wanted to give it back to Leon, but I don't know. Maybe in Europe we are dealing a bit more with uh, uh, free running buildings. Uh, yes, that's also a very exciting part here in the UK, and actually one of the key arguments that we have that understanding occupant behavior and uh, giving occupants uh, adaptation possibilities in our building design might be a key factor to avoid this transition to air conditioning buildings, right? Especially in the uh, housing stock, right? Uh, so if we give people good possibilities of shading, good possibilities of ventilation, and good possibility of doing these two things together, you know, it seems trivial, but Normally, when you ventilate, you cannot shade or the other way around. So it's about design for occupants that makes these things possible and actually uh, provides a better environment and helps the global environment challenges. Yeah. That's great. And uh, you obviously have lots of case studies in the, build, in the book. Um, do you have any really great examples of, of when designers have got that right? Uh, would you... I guess a question for each of you. What's your favorite example um, of a really well-designed building which has been uh, completed with occupants really at the center of the thought process throughout? Or is there one? Maybe, maybe I could give one. Unfortunately, it's not a case study in this book. It's actually a, a case study in my previous two books ago. Um, it's called the NREL RSF, that's National Renewable Energy Lab Research Support Facility in Colorado. Um, and I, I find they did an excellent job of um, considering all four domains of indoor environmental quality. So um, thermal comfort, indoor air quality, acoustic comfort, and visual comfort. Um, and just as maybe two examples, one, instead of having movable blinds on the south, um, because I think they were quite reluctant to give control to the occupants. So that's like a, maybe a little controversial and contradictory to what I said before. But they optimized the geometry so that no matter where the sun is in the sky, um, you can't have glare. It sort of blocks any direct sunlight from coming in, and but reflects it really well um, in terms of having diffuse light. 
Um, but the other thing is, despite having open plan offices, they, they have all sorts of features to absorb noise so that um, uh, it's, it's a relatively quiet space. And then they put these sort of phone booths where you can do work and have private calls or you can, you know, fire someone because we don't want the whole office hearing the firing. Um, but, but maybe one little interesting thing that they didn't anticipate, let's say, to, to be diplomatic. Um, they had displacement ventilation in the building, which made the ventilation system so quiet that it didn't provide a lot of white noise. And so they had to add um, white noise generators, as far as I understand. Um, so kind of an unintended consequence of, of uh, low ventilation rates. That's fascinating. Um, there's a question in the um, Q&A, which is, uh, again, very related to that. You, you seem to have a very good uh, knack for, for answering questions uh, and touching on the topic just before someone uh, asks about them. But uh, I just wonder if you could um, dwell a little bit further on the modelling of the relationship of occupants with the geometric design of the building and their behaviour and whether how much you've seen that um, work in other types of buildings as well as office buildings. I can touch on this and then maybe I'll let Farhang embellish. Um, so that the kind of unfortunate reality is that all of these occupant models, almost all the occupant models are built on um, observation studies over long term. So, you know, you take a, a, a room, you sense the occupants, you try to measure one or two behaviors like window opening and shade opening. Um, and then you simultaneously measure um, a few things that we think might predict behavior like, you know, uh, work plane illuminance or temperature or relative humidity. Um, and there's a big question of whether we can generalize that to other spaces. Um, a big question. When you dig into the models and you you talk to the authors, you realize that building had something really weird. More often than not, it had something really weird because it was like a research building. Um, and so I, you know, I, I was following one study for years, and I, I based some of my papers on it. And then I talked to the author and learned that um, the users in the building could adjust blinds from a seated position, uh, which is pretty unusual, I would say. And so they they were using more blinds blinds more often than um, a normal building. So on the question, the the it, it's a it's a big challenge um, because things are so circumstantial and and how can you generalize that? So there I guess a lot more research is needed. Thank you. Farhang, do you want to come in on that as well? Oh Farhang, I'm sorry, you haven't got that's yes. it. Um, just I just add a, a story to it. Uh, it's interesting. Just uh, the other day, I was in my studio, the design studio at school, and I teach. Uh, uh, we start to sort of support the design students with uh, building performance simulation skills, and uh, sometimes you regret what you teach them because, uh, as some of them fall into this trap of okay, now we know we know a bit of. Uh, uh, for example, incident solar radiation analysis, we can optimize a few things. And then they, uh, at very early stages of design in their journey, they are like, they're doing their first building. They think that, okay, now if I have optimized form and I have these angles, then that should translate into my design. So I sort of regret what I am teaching them. So tomorrow I have another lecture I'm preparing now. And I try to tell them, hey guys, these kind of analysis as useful as they can be, they don't necessarily and directly translate into a successful design. I think it sort of also applies to a occupant centric design and use of occupant models in building simulation. Of course, in the book, we cover possibilities of, for example, including occupant behavior models into the computational design support system. For example, if you want to, very simple example, common example, if you want to optimize the size of a window or the design of the shade, you can do it regardless of, of occupants, but we tell talk about it, how we can do it with consideration of occupants. Um, but still, I don't yet imagine or ever, ever imagine that we can do this computational support system in a way so that we replace the design process. So I get back to something that Liam touched on, 
I think if we have this knowledge how to model occupants, sometimes it can give us very uh, good basis for testing our designs. For example, testing the design that we have for different occupancy patterns, testing the design for different type of occupants. It is not necessarily an automated computational design, but it is a valid uh, testing platform for us to subject our design to different sort of uh, uh, boundary condition or let's say operation scenarios. Thank you. Um, and there's another great question in the Q&A because I know I uh, personally find it m much easier to conceptualize how, um, how you incorporate occupants in a design process but how do you deal with occupants and their needs um, in, an in the operational phase? And some of the case studies that you were talking about were buildings which were well into the operational phase. How did they differ? What did you have to do differently? I can start an answer and then I'll, I'll pass it to Farhang. I mean, the, so the big difference is that during design, there's a lot of uncertainty about occupants, whereas during operation, we know who they are. I mean, the other thing is that um, model occupants don't complain and real occupants complain. Um, al although there is a there's a study that looked at trying to model occupant complaints, uh, which I think is very interesting. I mean, not for the sake of anything other than to anticipate what the conditions uh, would be that would lead to complaints and avoiding those during design. Uh, Farhang, maybe you can answer that one better. Uh, no, no, that's, uh, I guess, uh, I cannot do much on that, but yeah, um, we have a specific chapter on this and I invite uh, those interested to specifically follow that chapter. Burak did a great job on thinking about occupant centric uh, uh, building control and simulation possibilities on that regard. So it's uh, in itself a very fascinating area of uh, uh, research, which is uh, a bit uh, further from what I uh, currently focus on, yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, a real strength of the book is is that diversity. So um, I shall look forward to uh, the 26th of June <laughs> when we get to find out more about that. So we're almost out of time. So I would just like to uh, ask one last question, which is, um, whose responsibility is it? Who is responsible for occupant-centric design? Whose job is it? It's an excellent question, not something I, I necessarily pondered. I mean, I, we, our ideal audience for this book is really all of the different stakeholders responsible for delivering buildings. Um, not just individual projects, but also manufacturers of products like um, um, thermostats, operable windows, et cetera. So I, I guess the brief answer is everyone. Arguably, even the occupants have a, a duty, but I think the first step to making sure that occupants even have a say is invite them to the table. Very rarely do we have someone advocating for the occupants. Thank you. Farhang, do you have any last uh, words? Yes, I can just add that one chapter of us, specifically, specifically chapter three by Clarice, actually addresses different stakeholders in this uh, system and how each uh, can play a role. Uh, but personally, as I'm again maybe teaching architects, I think the role of the designer, the role of the architect as someone who sort of have the ambition to realize and conceptualize and realize a project and is at the center of all these interactions with different stakeholders, I believe uh, they can play a key role in uh, addressing occupants needs and uh, behavior. Thank you both. That's been fascinating. Um, there is so much to learn here. So I'm really looking forward to, to all of this. Here is the list of the seminars which are coming up. Um, as I said, these are all available to book now, so you'll get uh, an email with the details of how to do that after this um, recording is finished. 
Um, but this is not the only subject that we are running webinars on. We have been running um, a series on urban building energy modelling, which has been primarily uh, theoretical, and we've now moved on to uh, a new strand which is looking at specific tools with an opportunity to, to understand the workflows, to look at how they can be used uh, and to learn from some real experts. So do please check those out um, if you're interested in large scale models as well. Um, the recording for this webinar, uh, as for all of the others that we've had in the past and the ones that are coming up as well, is available on our YouTube channel at IBIPSA University. So do please like and subscribe. You'll get um, notifications of when new content is added. Um, there is a wealth of content on there. There's about 60 videos there now, which is a real masterclass in building simulation, almost from first principles. Um, so please do check all of that out. And finally, um, I would like to invite you to consider joining IBIPSA as a supporting member. Um, our supporting members enable webinars like this and a wide range of other activities that IBIPSA undertakes to take place. And they also get a subscription to the Journal of Building Performance. Um, and there are two options there. You can either have a print subscription or online access. Uh, and you have the right to use the IBIPSA supporting member logo. The fees for supporting members are remarkably affordable and have remained unchanged since about 2019. So that might change soon. So do get in quick if you're interested. Um, but once again, thank you very much to Liam and to Farhang. That was fascinating. Thank you to the audience for all the excellent questions. And I do hope to see you at some of these exciting seminars which are coming up. Thank you very much for coordinating this, Pamela. No problem. Thank you.